Uh, what I'm going to try and do is give you an introduction to London in the 18th century. What I don't want to do is repeat what I've written in books. It's a waste of time because some of you have read them and it's insulting to you if I just, as it were, repeat what I've said. And for those people who want the basic information, you don't have to buy it. It should be in a library. There is this very heavy book called London, a history, which if dropped from any height would kill somebody at ground level. But it includes quite a lot of what the background. So what I want to do is to move past that. And I want to ask the question of how it was and why it was that London in the 18th century becomes the city which has the shock of the new. I mean, in many senses, London has that uh, role, as, for example, New York had in the 20th century. And when people want to see the new world laid out, if they're Europeans or from the uh, new world, they come to London. And my best example of that is somebody who hated Britain and hated the British, and that is Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Thomas Jefferson only came to Britain once, that was in 1786. He comes over for a trip uh, because he's the American ambassador to um, Paris, and he comes over to meet his counterpart in London, John Adams. Uh, Jefferson hated Adams as well, but Jefferson hated almost everybody. Um, in fact, on his deathbed, the both men died on the same day, and Jefferson actually said, is Adams still alive? He wanted to know that he'd lived for longer. Um, the, but Jefferson comes over to Britain, and what he does, um, uh, he claims to have been insulted by George III. There's no evidence for that. Um, but what he does is wants to see what is new about Britain. He's not interested in the past. He's not interested in history. He's interested in the new. That leads him to do some things outside London, two major things outside London. One is he goes to see a, a range of stately home gardens because he's very interested in uh, English gardens, capability brown gardens. And he goes as far as uh, Soho area in Birmingham. There's a Soho in Birmingham as well as in London, where he goes to see the manufactory of James Watt. But he also goes to see the new in London. And the biggest thing he goes to see is the New Albion flour mill, the biggest flour mill in the world at that time, powered by what steam engines, producing the flour for London. It was at the southern end of uh, London Bridge. And when he goes there, he meets Matthew Bolton. Now, Matthew Bolton is Watt's um, business partner. He's the man that actually sells the steam engines, and he's based essentially in London. And Bolton says to him, now Jefferson doesn't know this, but this is what Bolton says to everybody. Bolton says to him, what I sell here, sir, is power. That is what every man wants. And what he means is that, the, that he's showing him this demonstration of what industry can do. And looking around London, if you'd looked at it in the late 18th century, you would have seen a city that was essentially new. It had largely been burnt out, of course, with the Great Fire in 1666, and there had been a lot of post uh, post fire rebuilding. But the real cause of the new is not so much that rebuilding, though that is important, but it's rather the wealth generated by Britain's mercantile and industrial development. So among the great new buildings you can see, all uh, Jefferson's time, all dating to within the last hundred years, is the Bank of England, of course, the most successful national bank in the world, which had been established under Act of Parliament in 1694. You could see the great headquarters of the East India Company at Leadenhall Street. Um, you could see the uh, assorted works of the Navy round Greenwich. You could see great industrial plant of what is now Dockland, places like Wapping, Deptford, and of course earlier visitors had come precisely to see the same things. Peter the Great, of course, came to see the dockyards at Deptford as well as what was available to see at Greenwich. So travellers to Britain were interested in the new, they weren't interested in the old, and they were interested primarily in London. There was a 
uh, a um, guidebook produced to Britain in 1740 for foreigners. In matching columns, the text was in English and French, and it's 120 pages long. And of those 120 pages, there is discussion of Canterbury and of Cambridge and of Windsor and of Newmarket, in fact. But 112 of the 120 pages are devoted to London because that is what you want to see. That is the British city with roughly 10% of the uh, English population living there. It's a pre-census age, we can't be precisely sure, but roughly 10% of the English population living there and the prosperity of the country overwhelmingly concentrated. Now, to give you an example of that, I'd like to take a literary example, and it comes from one of the great achievements of British culture in that period, which is the foundation of the novel. And I'm quoting here from Joseph Andrews by Henry Fielding. And um, he has, towards the end of Joseph Andrews, he has uh, the female villain, Lady Booby, and she goes back to her rural parish where she has her country house. And he, he writes, she entered the parish amidst the ringing of bells and the acclamation of the poor, who were rejoiced to see their patroness returned after so long an absence, during which time all her rents had been drafted to London without a shilling being spent among them, which tended not a little to their utter impoverishing. In turn, after she'd been thwarted in her designs on Joseph Andrews, as you may recall, Lady Booby wants to seduce her footman. Uh, in turn, at the end, she returned to London in a few days, where a young captain of dragoons, together with eternal parties of, at cards, soon obliterated the memory of Joseph. Now, what's interesting about Fielding in this respect is a number of uh, points. First, if you look at Fielding's individual career, he came from Somerset, his early years were spent in Somerset and in Dorset, and in order to make himself, he goes to London and he becomes a Londoner. Indeed, famously so, because with his half-brother, um, he becomes the key figure in the establishment of the Bow Street Runners being drafted in by the government to deal with the crime wave in the late 1740s, early 1750s. Secondly, as a writer, as indeed all writers of the period, he has to be a figure in London. London is the centre of printing, London is the centre of publishing, London is the centre of bookselling. If you are not a writer living in London, you are nobody. So talent from throughout goes to London, both real talent, as in Dr Johnson, who of course comes from Staffordshire, and fictional talent, as indeed in the, that very novel I've just referred to, Joseph Andrews, where Parson Adams sets off for London and has all his adventures along the way, sets off for London in order to try and get his sermons published, because obviously that would be the only place he would be able to get them published. And indeed, if you look at Fielding's novels, uh, if you look at uh, the two famous ones, there are others, of course, um, uh, Tom Jones and Joseph Andrews, they both relate to journeys to London. Um, uh, some people being more successful in getting there than others, whilst Amelia, his last um, novel, um, is entirely set in London, apart from when one of the char characters goes on a short um, sea voyage. And Fielding's world, his engagement with London, captures the extent to which it both fascinated and horrified people. Now, in doing so, in some respects, literary figures were recreating in their own mind and in their writing what Roman literary figures had done about ancient Rome, the contrast between the town mouse and the country mouse, for example. But nevertheless, in novel after novel, in newspaper after newspaper, London is the central problem. It is the source of good, 
and it is the acme of vice. Vice being understood not simply in vice as we might think of it, but also vice in terms of a loving for luxury and consumerism, which were held to be weakening, vitiating the very empire, and indeed challenging the nature of Englishness. So if you're looking, for example, at the, at the critique of uh, foreigners and the critique of foreign influences that focuses elsewhere uh, in Britain on the idea of London. London males are held to be effete. Uh, they use things like umbrellas, uh, they, which are regarded as uh, an affectation from France. Um, they spend too much money on their clothes. Uh, they are inclined to eat foreign food, which is by its nature, it was believed insubstantial, not the roast beef of old England. And therefore they are weak as individuals. The women in London, it was believed, were more sexually promiscuous, Lady Boothby being a very good example, in fact, far more sexually promiscuous uh, than those elsewhere in the country. And it was also believed that London was the centre in Britain of male homosexuality, uh, which, of course, was a criminal offence in that period. Um, and indeed, the London magistrates every so often would raid what were known as the Molly Houses. The Molly Houses were male brothels, brothels for homosexual activity. Um, it need hardly be said that London itself was also, uh, most famously the area around Covent Garden, the centre of brothels with women in. Um, so that the sex trade was very much uh, dominated by the metropolis and also as a topic written about or depicted, you can think of Hogarth's prints. Um, Hogarth, of course, like Fielding, another figure living in London, disseminating impressions of London out through the medium of print, uh, in Hogarth's case, uh, engravings, to elsewhere in Britain and also overseas. So disproportionately, roughly, as I said, about 10% of the population live in London, but disproportionately, the attention devoted to it is far greater. Or take another element of that, uh, the newspaper press. Uh, in the 17th century, apart from when the royal court goes into, um, during the Civil War, goes to Oxford and a newspaper is published then, with the exception of that period, all newspapers in the 17th century are published uh, in London. Now, the Licensing Act, the act which uh, is uh, under which pre-publication censorship takes place, uh, we still have, obviously, post-publication censorship. You can say something that's true, but if you don't wish to engage with the legal action, you will have to be put up with censorship at the moment. Um, but pre-publication censorship comes to an end with the lapsing of the Licensing Act in 1695. And that is followed, as you will know, with provincial centres such as Norwich, Bristol, Exeter, York, having their own newspapers. Um, and you might argue, you might suggest, uh, if you're going to be sort of not thinking about this very much, that what this means is a lessening of London's voice and the development of alternative voices. Well, no. The provincial newspapers, with the exception of one in Canterbury, which was bi-weekly, the provincial newspapers were all out just once a week. They essentially consisted of reprints of sections from the London press. The London press, the major ones from which these newspapers were reprinted, were the tri-weeklies, uh, things like the London Evening Post, which were published on the major post nights and which were sent out to places like York, where the York Courant would just reprint it under the headline London. The only place in the country which had tri-weekly newspapers was London. The only place in the country which had Sunday, Sunday newspapers was London. The only place in the country which had daily newspapers, beginning with the Daily Courant in 1701, was, you would have guessed it, London. So in other words, the press, far from the fact that there are publications outside London lessening its influence, actually increases it. On top of that, 
when magazines develop, most famously from the 1730s, the Gentleman's Magazine and also the London Magazine, but a whole lot of other magazines as well, the Rambler, the Commissaire, so on and so forth, the Test, the Contest, um, they are all published in London. So London is very much the place in which ideas are molded and debated or enforced. Indeed, there is only one institution which isn't headquartered in London. I mean, I suppose you would include the universities with Oxford and Cambridge, but quite frankly, they're a waste of space in the 18th century. Uh, anybody that has a new idea is in London. Um, the only institution which isn't headquartered in London uh, is the church. Um, which obviously the Southern Diocese, the senior province, so, sorry, Southern Archdiocese, the senior province is headquartered in Canterbury. But in practical terms, the church is also headquartered in London because the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, obviously wants to be where the power is and spends most of his time in his palace at Lambeth. Um, so he's very much a London figure, and he is usually competing for influence with the Bishop of London. Um, so, for example, Gibson, who's the Bishop of London in the 1730s, is known as Walpole's Pope. That's Robert Walpole is the Prime Minister of the period, because he is Walpole's ecclesiastical advisor. So the church itself, although you might think the Canterbury element means that um, uh, it's, it's not London-centred, is London-centred, and that's taken a stage further because the bishops all sit in the House of Lords, the House of Lords meets in London, the bishops are expected to be there because they're part of the government vote, the government appointed them, the government expects to see them there, if they don't turn up they will get into trouble. Um, so the bishops also all have to have places where they can live in London, and um, they're not um, the grand palaces that people like the Bishop of Winchester had had in the medieval period, but they're still relatively uh, appreciable town palaces. So everybody that counts is there. What other elements can I think I bring out at this point? Well, first thing I'd say is this wouldn't have necessarily seemed obvious if you were looking at the politics of the situation in the early or middle 17th century. In the early or middle 17th century, of course, right up indeed until 1688, London was the center of opposition to the crown. And in many sense, therefore, a major, if not sometimes the major political problem was that of intimidating London. Uh, either by deploying troops or trying to deploy troops, um, or by taking steps against the Charter of London in order to limit its um, uh, legal rights, as was done by both Charles II and James II. Well, this situation, of course, changes with the Glorious Revolution of 1688 to 89, because part of the new political system is a key role for some of the most important of the London interests, particularly the financial interests. Now, obviously, there are still Londoners that fall out with government. One can think of the Wilkes affair in the um, 1760s. You can think, for example, of the excise riots in 1733. There are episodes in which the government falls out with London, but quite frankly, that tends to be with those people in London who don't count, who are political rabble. And it is only if you, as it were, transfer and become part of the establishment, as of course John Wilkes famously did, um, that you then, um, as it were, become a figure who has more consequence. So the financial interests in London, who are organised through the Bank of England, which essentially is the basis of the London financial interest, which funds and organises the national debt. Uh, the best book on that, it's a very dull book, but it's the best book, is PGM, Peter Dixon's The Financial Revolution, which goes into it in excruciating detail. But essentially, 
Londoners handle the national debt and the key political relationship in the country is between senior treasury figures and the senior London figures. And it's no accident that the four most successful, successful in the sense that they stayed in power for longest, the four most successful prime ministers of the 18th century were all first lords of the treasury who sat in the House of Commons. So as first lords of the treasury, they were able to have their links with the financial sector and sitting in the House of Commons, which was the key house in this period, they were able to direct government business. So the four are Sir Robert Walpole from 1721 to 42, Henry Pelham from 1743 to 1754, Frederick Lord North, he's called Lord, but that's an honorary title as the uh, oldest son of the Earl of Guildford, so he sits in the Commons, Frederick Lord North um, from 1770 to 1783, and William Pitt the Younger from 1783 to 1801, and then again 1804 to 6. Now these people are absolutely crucial because of their financial uh, interests and links. So to give you a good example, Henry Pelham, um, who is a key figure in the group known as the Old Core Whigs, a protege of Sir Robert Walpole, a brother of the Duke of Newcastle, who is the Secretary of State. Um, uh, they fall out with the other Secretary of State, Lord Carteret, and the King, George II, favours Carteret, who could speak German, who is interested in, Carter in George's projects on the continent, whereas Henry Pelham and Newcastle think they are dangerous and expensive. And um, Carteret and George II uh, decide to get rid of Pelham, whereupon the leading figures of the city announce that they will not be underwriting the national debt, whereupon a day later Carteret gets sacked and Pelham's back in again. And that's a kind of demonstration of the role of London in the political system. It's absolutely crucial. And this is fundamental for Britain's rise because Britain is a state that floats on credit. I mean, in essence, there is no defaulting at all, even though the national debt rises to hitherto, unpre um, hitherto for that period, unprecedented um, uh, figures. Whereas there are the equivalent of um, uh, financial bankruptcies um, in states, particularly like France, and even when France isn't bankrupt, the government is having to pay a far higher interest rate on its debt than the British government is. So during the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 63, the British government is usually paying 3% on its uh, debt. The French government is usually paying between 9 and 12%. Um, during the War of American Independence, when France, Spain and the Dutch come in on the side of the Americans, the Dutch, who are the major financial centre on the continent, Amsterdam, prefer to buy shares in the British national debt than in the French national debt, even though they're at war with Britain, because Britain obviously is a better credit risk. The um, sterling does not go off the gold standard, the convertibility to bullion, until 1797. And that is really to do with the fact that the, war, the Napoleonic, French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars are even too much for the British state. But it remains solvent. It introduces new taxation. Income tax comes in as a wartime emergency uh, with the government pledged to get rid of it in peacetime. Um, and actually they go on sustaining the situation, not only paying for the British war effort, but also providing large subventions to uh, their allies. Um, now, there's a whole host of factors bound up in that. Part of it is the confidence in a, a national debt that's based on a parliamentary guarantee in the sense that parliament will never default, as opposed to the belief that if you have a debt which essentially is the personal debt of a monarch, as in France, if the monarch defaults, the monarch defaults, you've had it. Partly it's the belief that there's the rule of law in Britain and law will protect financial contract. 
Partly it is the extent to which there is a fiscal and financial infrastructure based around a whole host of factors, such as the creation of the first stock market, first modern stock market, um, the creation of the first modern insurance market, the creation of a whole host of interacting fiscal um, institutions, essentially organised through the City of London, um, which helped to provide considerable stability, even when there are crashes. And of course, the biggest crash of all is the speculative bubble of the South Sea bubble at the beginning of the 1720s, um, when the leading stock other than the Bank of England uh, is politically um, in what is really a bit of a fraud, uh, pushed up to very, very, very high levels and then crashes with a lot of people um, suffering. Uh, the, the company essentially goes bankrupt, though it does keep going. Um, and that itself, uh, although it causes concern as to whether the whole fiscal system will crumble, uh, it's obviously much less monetized than the British fiscal system in 2008, when there was a, a crash, of course. Nevertheless, they managed to keep it going. So fiscal strength is one important thing that is linked on a reconciliation between capital and government, uh, the capital and the government, which is important. And if you want to see the contrast, you can, of course, look at Paris in 1789 or less dramatically, Constantinople, Istanbul in 1730, when there's revolution there and the Sultan gets killed, or uh, Madrid in 1766, um, when there are large scale riots and the government falls, or Brussels in 1787, when um, the Austrian government is kicked out, uh, the Austrian uh, uh, gov the Austrians ruled the Belgium. So in that sense, although we don't tend to see it in that light, London is actually singularly quiet. Yes, there are riots, not just against the government. I mean, the most spectacular riot, of course, is the Gordon riots in 1780. But in the end of the day, um, it is, you know, fundamentally a lot of noise, a lot of fuss. The government keeps going. In the end, the king gets fed up with the local justices of the peace and their inability to sort it out. And the king uh, sends troops in who shoot people, which is generally a way to concentrate minds. And that's the end of the riots. Um, and that's a very 18th century approach in the end of the day. And that reminds us that another cause of significance of London is London is where all the big trials are held. And then of course, the executions are all, are all in, pub, in public. So if you want, and it was seen as an entertainment, uh, quote um, a chap called Harris, who was a major lawyer um, uh, in my um, uh, London book, and, you know, he's gone off to see a hanging in 1746. It's a sort of jamboree occasion, uh, but big, big occasions. So the hanging of Earl Ferrers, for example, uh, the, um, uh, the British were very proud of that. Uh, Earl Ferrers um, from an, an old family, not just one of these new aristocrats, kills his steward. These days, it would be probably said he had bipolar uh, illness. Um, he was a, a temperamental and violent man. He's put on trial. He elects to go to trial in the House of Lords, which is his right as a member of the House of Lords. And the House of Lords condemns him to death. And the only difference is that he gets hung with a silken hemp, uh, you know, halter, so it doesn't hurt quite so much. Um, but, you know, this is the sort of thing they're very, that you know, London is a show. It's a show for the country in all different respects. Going back to Fielding, uh, you will know Fielding through his novels, but Fielding also wrote a series of plays in the 1730s. Of course, these plays are staged in London, of course, which is where the theatre was focused. And at least two of these plays consist about what happens to country people that come to London to see the sights. So it's an idea of a place which has, as it were, a command over the country in terms not just of the formal processes of government, but also in terms of appeal, of consumer standards, of the fascination of power and activity. Now, how does this 
feature on a, as it were, Britain growing more on the global scale? Well, there is by modern standards in the world of the 18th century, a crucial shortage of liquidity. I mean, liquidity, you know, these days, of course, there's no real basis for liquidity. Governments can just print anything they like. Um, in the 18th century, you're supposed to be running on a metallic currency system. So that in other words, the idea is that your currency is convertible to whatever it's going to be convertible to for a higher level coins, it's uh, gold or silver, a lower level, it's copper, usually copper. And indeed, um, you actually in parts of Britain, like where I live in the West Country, um, you know, people would accept Spanish gold coins or Spanish silver coins um, as currency because that's what they were. You know, they, they, they had their value in the metal content that they had. So there's an enormous shortage of liquidity because the idea is loan uh, credit has to be backed up with something which in the end of the day is, rede is redeemable in real value. And of course, Europe itself is running a negative credit balance with the Orient uh, in the sense that um, the Orient has things that Europeans want to buy, uh, particularly tea, ceramics, uh, silk, uh, calicos. And there's nothing that the Orientals want to buy off the Europeans. So there's a negative, uh, a negative uh, flow of bullion out. So the East India Company is shipping um, silver um, to, uh, to India with which to then buy stuff from China. Now, what that means is that London's success as a financial centre is absolutely crucial because London is the place in Europe where there is the most concentration of money, of liquidity. And there's a whole host of reasons for that. One, as I've already indicated, it's regarded as the safe place to put your money, whether you're British or foreign. And that's very, very important. Um, the only other significant financial centres in Europe are Amsterdam and Geneva. And that, again, comes from the sense that there is a degree of stability in those financial markets. Secondly, the British, although they are, as it were, leeching money out to the Orient, are running an enormous credit balance in other trades. So essentially, Britain in the 18th century is taking profit out of its colonies in the Caribbean and North America because it imports from them plantation goods, things like uh, um, sugar particularly, but say rice from Georgia, uh, indigo, tobacco from um, Virginia and the Chesapeake. It's, so it takes those goods and then re-ex, well obviously uses some of them themselves, but then re-exports them to the major European markets. So British trade from London to Hamburg, absolutely crucial and through Hamburg, it's then um, redistributed to Baltic and Northern German markets. Same from London to Livorno or Leghorn as they used to call it for the Mediterranean markets. And on top of that, the major new source of bullion um, in the European world, indeed in the world as a whole in the 18th century, is the discovery of significant gold deposits in southern Brazil, in the province of Minas Gerias, also large quantities of diamonds. Um, Portugal is in effect a, look, if you want to look at it in this way, although it's an independent state, it's also in effect a British um, colony economically and financially and Britain as its major protector uh, against Spain um, and the British also have the liquidity to develop the, um, the Brazilian economy. Um, so the gold comes to London and from London is then used for British purposes. So London is the great centre of liquidity. Some respects not attractively so. I mean as you probably know the two chief um, 
slaving ports are number one, Liverpool, and number two, Bristol. But actually, a lot of the credit on which slavery operates is coming out of the London money markets. So there are unattractive features to it, but there are also attractive features to it. If you are an industrial entrepreneur in uh, in Britain, if you want to develop a coal field, uh, if you want to develop ironworks, you will seek London capital in order to take yourself forward. And you'd get it. I mean, people in London are looking for investment opportunities. So there is a benign financial model, helped, of course, as well by very low taxation, particularly uh, very low taxation on um, uh, capital. Um, the major source of taxation is the land tax, um, which essentially is a tax on agricultural rent um, and um, a certain amount on some goods of uh, excise, customs and excise, um, um, but, but although not for re-export, if the goods are for re-export, um, but essentially this is a very low tax economy and very pro um, as it were, manufacturing and mercantile economy, and that definitely works to the benefit of London. So London um, in this period um, is developing quite rapidly. You have um, the major growth, the same as occurs in Paris, incidentally, though it's faster and further in, in London, the major growth to the West, uh, what we call the West End, um, so areas, and you can obviously see them named after uh, the politicians of the period, things like Harley Street, named after Robert Harley, first Earl of Oxford, so there's Oxford Street, um, Cadogan Place, named after William Cadogan, first Lord Cadogan, uh, a Whig politician of the 17 teens and 20s, and so on and so forth. So London goes to the West, and in doing so, creates an urban townscape which is really attractive to rural money and to the rural elite and for the rural elite the idea of coming to london they've always people have always come to london but the idea of coming to london becomes much more attractive the notion of a london season becomes much more pronounced and you develop what novelists such as fielding or later jane austen note um, which, for example, with the flight of Wickham, um, which is this bifocal view of London. So London, in their eyes, becomes two separate cultures, the London of the city um, and the London of the West End. And some people present the London of the city as a sort of uh, responsible, mercantile, essentially Protestant world of people that mean what they say and say what they mean, and the West End as a place of fops and, and uh, people who are decadent and sort of, uh, you know, uh, submerged in vice, as it were. Um, well, you know, you can take your viewpoints, but what you've got is you've got a broader London, you've got to a certain degree the development of um, south of the river, because whereas up to this period, there had only been one bridge across the river, uh, London Bridge, other bridges follow, the second bridge is Westminster Bridge, Blackfriars Bridge follows and so on and so forth. So south of the river develops and becomes a more significant center of population. Southwark has always been one, but a more significant center of population. Uh, outlier villages begin to develop more. Um, the, where London doesn't really grow appreciably is on the north bank of the Thames going down water. Uh, you know, it develops a bit. There is development in Shadwell and Wapping, obviously. Um, but I think it's fair to say that there's only development up to a certain extent. The major industrial area, apart from the docks and apart from shipbuilding, is actually South London. Um, areas like the uh, River Wandle in what's now, I think, Wandsworth, um, are the major concentration of industrial plants. And of course, Lambeth went on being a major centre of industry into the mid 20th century. So London also has, and this I think we will end on, 
a, um, a industrial and agricultural role which is significant. It is, of course, the largest market in the country. It is the largest market both in terms of um, the uh, consumption by its own residents, but also the largest market in terms of the distribution of goods outside, from outside, from London outside, both internationally and domestically. And therefore, there is a lot of attraction to manufacturing goods in London things like glass, for example, there are glass works. Um, so soap, uh, there are soap works. Um, so there is sugar refining, there is, the manu there is manufacturing for the London market and for export. Also, London is the great center into which food is brought. Um, food comes by a whole range of ways, by boat or or barge, barge down the Thames, boat, for example, from Sussex round the Kent coast, because it's actually easier to come that way around than to go through the Weald. Uh, wagons, although London clay isn't always kind to wagons, but wagons are also a thing. And many animals are driven to London, turkeys walking all the way from Norfolk. Um, cattle from um, South Wales or Devon, they are driven to London, fattened up uh, and then slaughtered for the London market. And of course, London's centrality increases enormously because of the last revolution to talk about, which is the transport revolution. Um, and the first Turnpike Act isn't till the 1660s, it's for a section of the Great North uh, road, there isn't really much turnpiking, in fact, to the 1730s, but between 1730 and 1770, uh, there is a complete transformation, and much of the country, by the end of 1770, uh, much of the country is within um, 20 miles of a turnpike, much of it within 10 miles of a turnpike, and the areas that are best served by turnpikes are the routes from London outwards, London to the West Country, London to Birmingham and on to Manchester, London to Norwich. And what this does is it transforms communication. The roads earlier had been intractable, difficult, and the standard way in which goods had been moved if by road was on panniers on the back of donkeys or horses. This is replaced by what are known as flying wagons, and flying wagon companies are the major way in which London goods are spread uh, between the 1770s and the bringing of a really intensive rail system, which is the 1840s, 1850s. So, for example, and there's a very good book on this for the West Country by Dor Dorian Gerhold. For example, there are big companies that bring down... Anyway, we're back, we're back. That's the, I suppose it's the problem of being living in the provinces. Um, OK, I was talking about the flying wagons. Also, of course, you get... Um, the carriages. The carriages, of course, carrying um, uh, individuals, carrying small amounts of luggage, but including newspapers. Those are the ones that are developed very rapidly. Carriage services going, for example, to Norwich, to Salisbury, are on to one a day by these early 1760s. So that the vo and then they increase in number considerably. So the country is becoming more joined up. Now, clearly, this is not the canal system which is being built separately. The canal system is for freight, and the canal system does not focus on London, although London is served by river and canal. But the point is, in terms of the individuals who live in the country, in terms of their ability to disseminate information, to move themselves around the place, it is easier to move to or from London by 1770 than ever before. So that London's influence is coming stronger and stronger. And I think that's very much a case in the late 19th, sorry, the late 18th century and by the end of the century the image of London is overwhelmingly the image that is being disseminated around the country and London ideas, London habits, London books on things like pronunciation are those that are most common 
around the country. So by the end of the century, London is very much uh, the dominant feature as far as England is concerned, and increasingly has an impact as English power, British power spreads, increasingly has an impact in the wider world. Thank you very much.